We are about to begin another episode of the Prosperidin webinar series. From their unique perspective as dentistry's embezzlement experts, Prosperidin's team brings you information you will not find anywhere else. Now sit back and relax while Prosperidin's Amber Weber, Wendy Askins, and David Harris address the issues that are important to you. Hello and welcome to our Prosperidin Monthly Power Hour. Today we have a special uh, group of individuals. All of our examiners across Canada and the United States have teamed up so that we can introduce all of you to the Million Dollar Club, where we want you to meet uh, Embezzlement Elite Group. The details for today, uh, our webinar is going to last about an hour and a half. Um, we always reserve time at the end to answer any questions, but during the webinar, please submit your questions using the question and answer button in Zoom. We'll try to answer as many as time permits. For those of you who uh, couldn't make it, if you have friends that you want to see this, uh, we ha we'll have this recorded and it will be available tomorrow online. Uh, we will offer continuing education. It is available thanks to our friends through um, Altura Periodonics. Uh, at the end of this uh, webinar, you will receive a link with your CE credit and registration for our monthly power hour for next month. Thanks, Amber. Um, in case you're wondering, the, uh, the, the, the third leg of our triangle, Wendy Askins, is actually on assignment today, so she won't be with us. Um, it is just Amber and me as, as hosts. Um, and if my background looks a little bit different, it's because uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm on what's called isolation. Uh, I went to visit my son last week. Uh, he's going to college, and uh, the way it works here is that when you cross a boundary and you come back, uh, they they lock you up for 14 days. So I'm I'm at home in my home office, and uh, um, so isolation's good so far. I get out on Halloween. Uh, next month we're going to talk about something called healing after stealing. So if you've been embezzled from, and uh, you know the statistics, probably 80% of you will be sooner or later. How do you get back to equilibrium after? So we're, uh, we're on uh, Thursday, November 19th, same time as tonight. Um, if you'd like to get in early, there will be a registration link, as Amber said, that, that will come in the email that you usually get toward the end of this show. And of course, we'll be reminding you a few times before next month as well. So the title says it, we're gonna talk about what what happens to people um, and, and we'll look at this from a lot of through a lot of different lenses we'll look at the doctor the family uh, staff we'll talk about how to get back to normal after you've been embezzled uh, we're thrilled today to have, uh, have have some guest presenters and we have five of them um, and each of them is, is a prosperity and investigator. They've, uh, they, they all bring different skills and attributes to the table. <coughs> Excuse me. And we gave them each a very simple challenge. We said, we want you to bring one of your most interesting cases uh, today and talk about it. So we'll tell you a little bit about these people and then we're just gonna turn the floor over to them to, uh, to talk about their stories. And uh, the first person is Sonia Hudson. Uh, Sonia lives in Ontario, Canada. Uh, she's, uh, she, she does a lot of our Canadian case files. And uh, Sonia has been with us, gosh, I think at least, uh, at least eight years, and I'm, I'm probably missing a couple, but she'll set me straight. Sonia is unquestionably one of the most organized people I have ever met. Her, her, her mind is just like this gigantic file cabinet. It's, it's just amazing to watch. Our other, uh, our next examiner that is going to share his story tonight is Tony Olbrandt. He is one of our U.S. examiners. Uh, he resides in Georgia. He is one of three supervising examiners with Prosperidin and a lead member of Prosperidin's litigation support services team. The interesting thing to know about Tony, he was one of the first people that helped me when I come on with Prosperidin, and he is known in Prosperidin as the data analysis wizard. He is an Excel spreadsheet guru. Um, so if you ever have an Excel question, he is the person to talk to about it. 
No doubt about that whatsoever. Um, next is Kelly Paxton. And Kelly is a little bit different in our team in the sense that almost everybody comes from a, from a dental background. Kelly does not. Um, Kelly's had a, a, a tremendously varied and interesting career. She's been a special agent for the United States government. She's uh, worked in a sheriff's department. She was a fraud investigator for Nike, you know, the guys who make uh, the shoes that my son buys. Um, she's, she's really uh, been in a lot of different facets of fraud investigation. She's also known nationally and internationally for her work in what's called pink color crime. And um, Kelly, um, Kelly's uh, really celebrated in terms of, of her research and, and speaking about female embezzlers. And when we talk about dentistry, of course, we all know that, that the majority of embezzlers are female. Next is Pat Little. He resides in Florida. The interesting thing about Pat is he is, he is very well accomplished. He started his career as a practicing dentist and he had success, two successful dental practices. From that, Pat um, continued to complete his education in accounting. And from there, he was able to uh, be diversified in his clinical and dental experience and merge that with his financial knowledge uh, in the dental world. So Pat, Pat is very, very qualified. And it's interesting all the facts and the things he knows um, from the clinical side to the business side. And he's just an all-around nice guy to boot. Uh, last and but by no means least, Scott Clifford. Um, Scott is a, is another one of our supervising examiners. So we have we have three levels of examiner called fraud examiner, senior fraud examiner, and supervising examiner. Supervising examiners are the people that we give cases to that no sane person would accept. And. Uh, I think Scott will will freely admit that. Now, um, I'm just going to mention a little technical challenge with Scott tonight. Scott lives in Northern California. And if you watch the news at all, you've heard that wildfires once again are a factor. Um, and Scott uh, Scott was on warning for a couple of days that, that, uh, that they were likely to have their electricity turned off. In fact, that has happened. Now, Scott's able to be with us by phone, but uh, we, we won't be able to get to see him in person. The good news is, of course, we knew this was coming, so we recorded Scott by video and he will, uh, we, we pre-recorded his segment and um, you'll still be able to see it. So uh, I'd like to thank Scott for uh, really going to heroic efforts to overcome the technical challenges, but um, Scott is just an amazing investigator and he, um, he, he, he really tackles some challenging files and, and, and come out, comes out shining every time. So we're thrilled to have Pat with us as well. So first up tonight is, uh, is, is Sonia Hudson. Um, Sonia, when you're ready, let's uh, turn on your video and, uh, and, and, and tell everybody your story. Okay. Well, thank you, David, for those wonderful introductions, including mine. Um, and uh, let's get started. So basically, let me introduce you to Jennifer Leslie. Jennifer Leslie was a dental office manager in a multi-office dental practice who embezzled over a half a million dollars in approximately three years. I was engaged to investigate and work with the regional police to put together a case and predominantly it was to capture the methodology used as well as the total amount embezzled. Next slide, please, David. So let's talk about how Leslie did this. Well, she didn't have uh, the normal access, uh, what we see in most of our cases to the uh, accounts receivable or the patient transactions in the dental practice management software. Um, her um, what, so what she did use was what she had access to. Um, and you'll find that with embezzlers that they will often uh, find whatever means they can uh, to perform the activity that they need. So in her case, what she had access to was the accounts payable records. So this was a new case for me, one of the first ones I've done um, in the accounts payable side. So what she had um, actually uh, done is she had set up suppliers and vendors uh, in their accounting software. 
um, with names that the dentist would recognize. So they were legitimate names of suppliers and vendors. Um, but in many cases, uh, the monies actually were directed into her personal bank account. Um, another thing she did was she was uh, in control of payroll and the bonus payment plans. And um, often she overpaid herself on uh, many occasions um, in this respect. So I had uh, documented just over a half a million dollars in the three year period. Next slide, David. Okay, some of the warning signs and the symptoms that were identified. So the dentist um, was working as hard as ever and his practices were running smoothly and he just didn't see uh, the bank balance supporting uh, the work that was being done. And often that's, uh, that's the first clue um, for a dentist is that, you know, there's not enough money in the bank and we're working hard, the chairs are full and we don't have any explanation for that. Another symptom that we uh, the dentist identified was in the behaviors um, displayed by the suspect. So in her particular case, she had um, addictive and compulsive behaviors, uh, gambling being one of them. She was also living beyond her means, vacationing, uh, purchases, vehicles, um, all, all of that nature. So living beyond her mean, means is definitely uh, a, a flag for us. And um, one in particular with respect to her duties is that when she was away from the office, she resisted having anyone cover for her and that her duties were held over until she returned. So if she was sick or on vacation, she didn't want anybody covering her, her duties. So those were a few of the um, warning signs. Uh, definitely there were a lot more, but those were some of the ones that stood out in um, this particular case. Next slide, David. Okay, some outside factors. So you would think with it being an accounts payable issue and um, you know, with the payables and the accounting software that the accountants may have uh, been prone to see this um, issue, but in this case, they did not find the anomalies um, and, and not through any fault of their own. They were seeing the payables being made to vendors and suppliers that they too may have seen repeatedly over the, the months and the years, um, but they don't necessarily see where the money's going at the other end. So um, that uh, it was something that, you know, required uh, some extra identification. So in this particular case, um, the bank security department had uncovered the fraudulent activity. Um, they had reported it to the uh, dentist and then the police were involved. Now you would think, oh, everything should be good. Everybody should be able to do their job and, and carry on with this case. But actually, um, the police needed Prosperidence help. So we were engaged to help, and particularly we um, spent our time documenting uh, what was going on, the methodology that was used, as well as monetize, monetizing uh, the total losses. And this was all necessary for them to build their case. They couldn't do it on their own and they needed help doing that. So a lot of times, you know, even if it was the accountant who identified something or another, um, another party, uh, Prosperident helps put that together in a nice package so that, you know, all the facts are gathered uh, coherently into a document with everything you need to proceed with the case. So the outcome in this particular case, um, the suspect was charged. She was sentenced to two years in prison, and then she will serve a three-year probation thereafter. Next slide. So just to uh, sum this up, uh, basically, uh, what it comes down to is if you feel something is not right, trust your intuition. If your spidey senses go off, likely they're correct and something needs investigating. Um, you know, ha ha look into it deeper at your end. You could engage Prosperity to do a more thorough examination, but definitely if something feels off, don't ignore it. Likely, you know, something is going on. Um, another thing to uh, be cognizant of is behavior of your staff um, in the office. So a lot of suspicions are recognized from the behaviors of the staff. Um, if you're not sure what these behaviors or red flags would be, Prosperidant offers a embezzlement risk assessment questionnaire. You can request one of those. And when you complete that, um, it'll identify whether you have something to be concerned about or not. 
So, you know, if you're not familiar with the signs, we have a whole list of those and we can help you with that determination. Um, unfortunately, embezzlement happens and it can happen anywhere in your practice. It's not always going to happen in the front end of the office. It could happen in the back end of the office, as in this case. So um, what, what the takeaway is from this particular case is that if somebody wants to embezzle, uh, they will find a means to do it. So you need to be um, prudent, keep your eyes and ears open, your finger on the pulse, and, um, and that's about it. Thank you very much. Wow, Sonia, great, great information. Um, and just so everybody knows, we've asked one of the other examiners who's on the uh, on the panel with us to uh, to just have a minute or two discussion with Sonia. Um, and in this case, it's Scott Clifford, who, as I mentioned, is is with us by phone. Scott, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Okay. Beautifully. All right, um, Sonia. My question for you on this case was. Were all of the outgoing stolen monies electronic or did she steal any paper payment vehicles like outgoing checks or anything? Or was it just exclusive transfers out of the doctor's account to her personal account? Great question, Scott. So in this particular case, um, most of the transactions were done through electronic means, through an electronic fund transfer uh, key fob provided by the bank, which the suspect had full access to as part of her job duties. But uh, that didn't mean she didn't cut checks and um, other methods for like payroll. She did do some payroll issues where she overpaid herself. So those in some cases were transfers. Sometimes the bonus checks were uh, the bonuses were done in checks. So she did a little bit of both, but predominantly it was electronic fund transfer. Perfect. Thanks, Scott. Okay, our next um, story is going to come from uh, Tony Olbrandt. Um, so, Tony, whenever you're ready and you have your camera ready, we're excited to hear hear your story. Hello. Uh, thank you, David and Amber, for those very kind words. Uh, the case I would like to share with everybody uh, is personally one of the most interesting ones that I've worked in my fraud investigating career. It involved a dentist uh, and their spouse. And sort of the background is the, uh, the dentist was working as uh, an associate with another practice and married a CPA. The CPA also had a small personal accounting practice on the side as well as worked as uh, a CFO for some other businesses. After about a year or so of marriage, the dentist left uh, the practice she worked for and then started her own practice. And so at that point they became um, not only man and wife, but business partners as well. If you could change the slide please, David. So the background uh, that they established for themselves in this business was that the, the spouse, the CPA, was in charge of the accounting records, as one might suspect, as well as preparing, delivering the deposits to the bank and um, the expense side activity as well, paying the bills, accounting for um, all the monies coming in and coming out. And sort of oddly enough, maintained a duplicate set of every patient's records inside of QuickBooks. Um, could you uh, change slides, please, David? And it was the handling of the expenses and the duplication of the patient records inside of the QuickBooks data that was one of the first red flags for the dentist. On top of that, uh, the deposits, both in timing and in amount, didn't really make sense. And it was something that they noticed for a while, but didn't really say anything immediately, didn't, didn't raise the questions in a timely fashion, other than just kind of quietly thinking to themselves. The timing was scrambled and illogical of the deposits, uh, the amount of money 
coming out of the business accounts to various other purposes kind of raised some red flags. And it was a particular transfer that was around 175,000 that kind of was the, the, the straw that broke the camel's back there. And that's when some uh, personal investigating took place and through that uh, sort of personal investigation, a number of other bank accounts were discovered. And then from there, kind of the magnitude of the situation started to come into view. Uh, at which point the, thank you, David, the uh, marriage became sort of not sustainable as well as the business partnership. And so at, at a critical juncture, Prosperident was brought in and an investigation into the accounting, both for the revenue side and the expense side took place. Um, fortunately, we were able to bring about um, a very positive outcome for our client, for the dentist and uh, the, the, the ex-spouse, the ex-business partner and their activity kind of became known and it was probably as, as good of an outcome in, in such a bad situation as, as one might hope for. Uh, the, the main takeaways here, and one of the reasons I chose this case to highlight, are um, going back to what Sonia said, you want to tr definitely trust your instincts. If something feels off, there's a good chance that it is off. Um, and second, the, the concept of trust is, is really something that is fluid. And what I mean by that is uh, it's, it's something that has to constantly be reaffirmed. You, you can't just trust somebody at one point and then rely on that moving forward. And thirdly, uh, office policies, procedures, internal controls, they need to be followed by everyone. It doesn't matter if you're a spouse, if you're a dentist, or really if, even if you're the owner. If policies and procedures are in place. They, they should be followed, you know, to the letter of, of the, uh, the definition there and um, kind of all of those three concepts tie together. If something feels off, it is, and make sure that everyone is kind of following all the rules there. Uh, and with that, I'll kick it back to uh, David. Wow. Th thanks, Tony. That, that was really an interesting story. Um, I know Pat Little uh, if you're available and you have your video ready, you had a couple questions for Tony about this case. Sure, uh, great presentation, Tony. Uh, very, very interesting case. And I really find this interesting because I talk about this a little bit when I lecture. And a lot of the participants consider this a little bit lighthearted. They kind of glance over at each other and smile. And I've even had dentists come up to me and say, well, you know, my spouse gets everything anyway. So it's all just sort of a lighthearted type of thing, but in your case, this wasn't lighthearted for the doctor. And I was just wondering if the doctor ever discussed with you the emotional impact that this had and how it might've affected the practice. That is a great question. And because that's oftentimes an overlooked aspect of these types of breach of trusts. And she did. Uh, this was a, a particularly hard time in their life and uh, the idea of the breach of trust and the fallout from that uh, was discussed and the impact really was immense because it was the depths of not only the deceit, but the quantity of money that was uh, mishandled. It was so both sort of the quantity and the quality, if you will, of this, these schemes shook that person to their core and you know I, I, I did my best to in, in having these conversations about the emotional aspect to remind them that it wasn't their fault it, they, they really cannot blame themselves for this and in, in trying to alleviate some of that blame to kind of mitigate some of the, um, the emotional distress that they were under and I, I really, the, the reason why this case was so interesting to me was that it gave me a chance more so maybe in, than in other cases to help someone begin the process of piecing back not only their life, but 
their emotional well-being because this weighed heavily and the outcome that we could bring about I think was really the end of that chapter and sort of the beginning of the next phase and and uh, certainly encourage that person to do what was necessary to repair um, the damage wrought on them so that they can trust again because I, I know that you know when you experience such a breach of trust you might be hesitant to um, to have another business partner or or anything along those lines. Great story, guys, and uh, very topical because again next month we're talking about exactly that how to how to get back the healing after stealing thing. So, uh, Tony, thank you, and and Pat, um, and and now I'd like to invite uh, Kelly Paxton, who I. Um, introduced a little bit earlier to uh, to join us and talk about uh, a really interesting case. Thank you, David. My case is interesting in that I came to the prosperity world a little differently. You heard that. I was used to dealing with bad people. I was a federal agent for U.S. Customs. I was armed 24-7. I got to drive fast cars and not get speeding tickets. And then eventually I ended up at a local sheriff's office. I got my certified fraud examiner designation. And uh, one of the things I'm kind of most proud uh, of the color crime is I'm known as the fraud hashtag queen. So we start today with honest people steal, hashtag honest people steal. And when I got to the sheriff's office and I started working on regular, I call it Main Street embezzlement cases, and several of them being dentists just in my you know, time at the sheriff's office. Um, I, it was eye-opening to me because I was used to bad guys. And all of a sudden I see um, primarily women, not all women, but primarily women who are stealing from Main Street businesses such as dental or orthodontic practices. Practice. So it changed the whole way I kind of looked at crime because I was used to bad guys. Um, so that's how I start this presentation off. And David, if you want to go to the next slide. The other thing I noticed when I was at the sheriff's office doing these embezzlement cases, um, it always starts small. And that was a little bit different from when I did, you know, federal law enforcement. They stole bigger at one time. But when I was working Main Street embezzlement, dental embezzlement cases, it started small. It wasn't ever a check for a million dollars. It wasn't even a check for $10,000, but it really started off small. And um, I think David can probably appreciate this being in Canada. It kind of is like a graph, like a hockey stick. So um, it may start with $10 and it may just, you know, hit to a million dollars like um, Betty did in this case. So the next slide, David. And this is also what I mean by it starts small. We call this up shopping. When you will send your you know, administrative assistant or the office manager to Costco to buy gloves or PPE or you know things for the break room. And then you notice that they throw, or you don't notice that they throw in like this $200 facial kit. Do you actually look at those receipts? And that's kind of a big way it could start small. I've seen cases, one particular, it started with three pairs of Costco jeans and she ended up not dental, stealing $500,000. So it can start very, very small. And when it starts small, I really think you have to nip it in the bud because I have seen the small $10 go to hundreds of thousands of dollars. So next slide, David. Um, again, hashtag gambling is a pink flag, much like uh, Sonia's case with Jennifer is Betty stole a million dollars over 10 years and Betty was a prolific gambler and um, she also had the lifestyle. Betty's story was such that um, her husband had a good middle class job and then he lost and he had to become a bus driver and their lifestyle did not change when his income dropped significantly. Betty found a lot of solace at the local casinos. And everyone at the dental practice knew that Betty liked to go to the casino and she liked to gamble. They also knew when she won because she'd come back to the office beaming, just happy. And if she came back sad and angry and mean, that's because she lost. 
Um, Cause ENOs are built on customer losses, not customer winnings. So um, as far as paying attention to your employees, the mood swings from gambling are pretty huge. And if you know you have an employee that gambles um, and they've got mood swings like that, I, I think you know that, you know, it isn't going so well for them. So much like Sonia's case, there was gambling and lifestyle. Betty um, had grandchildren that she liked to spoil quite a bit. And uh, it just it all caught up with her. So Betty ended up getting five years. And what was really sad, and it'll probably be discussed in next month's, the healing after stealing, is the dentist still missed Betty. At the sentencing, Betty got five years. He, I asked him how he was, and he said he missed her. And his wife almost clocked him because she had told me previously it was the hardest thing that she and her husband had gone through as a couple. And... Um, but he said, you know, Betty made life really easy for him. She didn't make life easy for the hygienist, but she made life really, really easy for the dentist. Um, so that was Betty's story. And unfortunately, the sad part of Betty's story is she passed after doing her five years in prison. And I really think, you know, numerous people who go to prison, their life expectancy is cut short. So I think... Um, Pat is asking questions. Oh, no, Tony. Sorry, Tony. What questions do you have? Uh, yes, that is a fascinating story. And what I was wondering as I was listening to you tell that is um, kind of a two-part question. What, other than the mood swings, what other type of warning signs did the dentist see? And then did the dentist's emotional attachment to that employee sort of cloud their ability to objectively view the situation in your opinion? Yeah, I'll do the second one first. Um, Betty was part of the dentist family, not the, you know, figuratively speaking. She went, she worked for a long time, obviously over 10 years. And um, she went to the family's children's graduations, weddings, graduation from college. She was literally part of the family. And the dentist also said, had I known that she needed the money, I would have helped her out. Now, I don't think he would have given her a million dollars, but, you know, he, he was incredibly generous. And then as the first part of the questions, as far as her mood swings, she would be very, very generous when she wanted the casino to the hygienist. She'd come in and they were embarrassed by some of the um, sort of expensive gifts that she would give them because, you know, how could you afford that? But then she'd say, well, I did well at the casino over the weekend. But then the mood swing when she didn't do well, you know, she, she got nasty. I will say she was nasty to the hygienist, but she always kept the dentist kind of isolated from any of that drama. Hmm. Well, next up um, is going to be our original dentist, Mr. Pat Little. If you're ready to go, we're ready to hear your story. Sure. Well, thank you, David and Amber. Uh, I want to introduce you to Kim. Kim was a very good embezzler. It turned out that she was also just about as good at lying. And through her lies and her resourcefulness, it enabled her to commit embezzlement over a, a long period of time. Uh, I will say this case, uh, she has been charged criminally. It is um, pending a trial. So everything I'm going to talk about uh, is related to this case. We should still consider that as, as, a, as alleged. So Dave, if you don't mind, next slide, please. I'm gonna start with, I'm gonna say Dr. One. Uh, this was the original doctor that Kim worked with. She had been with the doctor for about 10 years and was doing such a great job. The doctor trusted her with everything. Uh, he, he admits now that he didn't, he didn't look at anything. He just completely trusted. And what that enabled her to do though, is she was able to commit embezzlement in a multiple ways. One is what we call revenue side, which means she was able to commit embezzlement through the practice management software, but she was also the bookkeeper. And through that, she was able to also commit embezzlement through the expense side as well. And she was smart enough not to embezzle so much that the doctor thought anything was wrong. 
uh, he got the first wind that something might be wrong when his CPA called him and said, something's wrong with your accounts receivable. Uh, he had no idea why. So he asked him, let's meet after work today and let's just uh, discuss what's going on. And he still didn't suspect anything. But when she went to lunch, she, she emailed him a resignation. And I think that was the doctor's first clue that something might not be right. So he caught, contacted us. And at that point, we conducted a, an exam. And this embezzlement turned out to be nearly a half million dollars. So it, it was a very painful thing for the doctor. Uh, obviously, she, she was terminated. And to the doctor's credit, he, he has filed um, a criminal complaint. And as I said, now she is awaiting trial. And um, next slide, Dave, if you don't mind. So at that point, my job was pretty much done, at least until I needed to be a, an expert witness if it ever uh, comes to that. So about two years later, a uh, second doctor hires us. I'm just going, this is doctor two. When I interviewed her, she had uh, mentioned that she also had no idea anything was wrong in her practice. But in this case, she was tipped off by her treatment coordinator. And the treatment coordinator suspected that the office manager might be uh, up to something suspicious. As a result, when I took a look, sure enough, I discovered uh, cash theft. And thankfully this was caught early enough that it wasn't a large loss for this doctor, but it was still a devastating thing that the doctor went through. But she was grateful to the treatment coordinator who had shown that she was a great employee by that time. So the treatment coordinator was promoted to the office manager. And of course, you probably already know who that treatment coordinator was. It, it was Kim. So Kim had true, proved to be quite mobile. She was with Dr. One. She had a short stint as a dental consultant and then ended up as a treatment coordinator for the second doctor. And the problem there is, as a treatment coordinator, she didn't have access to the financials. So she took it upon herself to find something with the office manager. So Kim was responsible for getting the office manager uh, terminated she becomes the new office manager. And a, bet, a year later, everything seemed to be going fine. And next slide, Dave. And what happened now is again, the doctor had no idea anything was going on. Uh, so she signed up for an implant symposium in Las Vegas, and she took the key members of her dental team to this symposium. She got a frantic phone call from Kim and said, I'm not going to be able to make the symposium. Uh, U.S. immigration has denied my entry into the United States. And again, a very shocking thing for the doctor to hear. And when she asked Kim why, what's going on, this is where she proved how good of a liar she had been, actually for a number of years. But she told this doctor, well, Dr. One has been charged with uh, insurance fraud. And he is about to be charged criminally, and I may be a witness in this trial. And I, I guess that's why they uh, detained me. And the doctor, doctor bought it. But obviously, at that point, though, she called and through a conversation with David, he was able to put two and two together. So I got rehired to see Dr. Two. So I ended up, because of Kim, investigating three different cases. Uh, so it's, this just goes to show how dedicated somebody can be when they really feel the need to steal, especially if they're resourceful, they have financial knowledge, and they're also pretty good at lying. So next slide, please, David. So what I wanna leave you with is why it's so important to review resumes, talk to the prior employers. Obviously background checks can be helpful. In this case, a background check would not have been as effective because Kim has not been convicted yet, but it's still a step to take, but it's vital. You must be able to check with former employers, no matter what she says, because it turned out that when Kim first came to work for this doctor as treatment coordinator, she specifically said, please don't call Dr. One because he's, he's in some little bit in some trouble. And it would probably just be best if you didn't get involved. And of course, Dr. Two said that sounds reasonable and didn't um, call Dr. One. Plus at the time she was not having a financial responsibility. So she thought it's pretty safe to hire her anyway. And then of course, when she was promoted to office manager, it never occurred to the doctor to check former employers. So please trust your team, but verify everything. And if you're not sure how you conduct a, a good resume search, 
uh, we can certainly help you out in that regard. Yeah. Fantastic, fantastic story, Pat. And the fact that you did it three times is amazing. Um, I know Kelly's gonna ask you a couple questions about that case, Kelly. So Pat, it, Dr. One, did she start stealing right away or did, it, did, did you know when she started stealing at Dr. One? We don't know the exact time she started stealing, but uh, going back through records, it, it looks like she started stealing pretty much as soon as she started uh, to work. So she had been with this doctor for nearly 10 years and uh, I got fresh evidence going back five years, but then subsequently it became evident that it looks like she had been stealing for quite a long time since. So that's one of the things, if I see someone that has, starts to steal within six months, at a new position, they've done it somewhere else. So it makes me think that she, I, who did she work for before Dr. One? She may have stolen to that person also. We'll call him Dr. Zero. Yeah, <laughs> patient not, Zero. Not, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so it took her about six months to get access to the, the cash side of the Dr. Two, is that correct? Yeah, she has started out with access to the practice management software. So that was obviously the, her, the first avenue uh, for the uh, embezzlement. Uh, then obviously, as she worked, uh, she uh, appeared to be a great employee. She gained the doctor's trust. So then uh, the checkbook was turned over to her. And then actually, it's not part of this particular case, but uh, he was so impressed with her. He actually has a, another business on the side. She became the bookkeeper for that business. And it was subsequently found by another investigation, not through us, but uh, there was some uh, illegal activity, we'll say, uh, with that other business as well. I have only had one victim in all my time doing embezzlement cases that disliked their employee, only one. And even with that, he said he never gave her access. She still managed to steal $450,000. So yeah, this sounds like it's not her first or second rodeo, possibly her third. I would agree 100% with that. Where there's a will, there's a way. Yes, thank I'll, you. I'll, I'll add a personal note here if I could. Um, I got a call from Dr. Two, who I, who I knew already. Um, and Dr. Two called me to discuss the, the situation in her office and was describing the antics of her office manager. And I knew that Dr. Two and Dr. One lived in the same city. And I asked Dr. Two, is her name Kim? And Dr. Two just about fainted when I asked that question and said, how the hell did you know that? And anyway, I, I had kind of put the two and two together. And that's what, that's what said Pat, if I can put it this way, uh, to see Dr. Two for investigation three. How's that? Uh, absolutely. All right. Thank you, Pat. Thanks. Um, so we, uh, we, we do have uh, Scott Clifford. And um, before I start this, I want to show you a picture that Scott took outside his house the other day. Um, this is looking down his street, and that's what it looked like. And uh, Scott told me there's no filter applied here. I mean, this is this is actually how it looked. And I said, that makes total sense to me because I'm famous for having no filter. Um, so that's Scott Street. He is, he is with us by phone, but um, we're just going to run the recorded video of his, his description of his, uh, his embezzler. So let's see what Scott had to say. All right. The case that I want to talk to you guys about tonight is a, a very interesting and compelling case for me because the densest that is involved is just one of the kindest, most compassionate people that I've ever got the opportunity to work with. And I can tell that from the first call. She was just a, a fantastic person. And she got into dentistry later in her life um, for all the right reasons. She wanted to help people. She wanted to help not just patients and, and, and do good dental work for people, but she also wanted to build a successful business where she could employ people and, and help other people along the way. Um, the decision for her to go into dentistry was done for all the right reasons and the person that she hired the office manager danielle powers was a friend of hers she was trusted um and everything worked out fine 
uh, for the most part, as far as the doctor was concerned. They were building a good practice. They had good, good rapport, good patient base. Um, but there were some things that she noticed on her day sheets that she really wasn't quite clear on. And as a new dentist, you ask the office manager what's going on. Um, and the office manager always had a good reason for things. You know, there was always a good excuse or a good uh, story uh, that she was telling. And, you know, the doctor really didn't think much of it, but there was just something in the back of her head that told her that something was wrong. And finally, when she discovered some real anomalies, she, she contacted Prosperident, and, and, and that's when we spoke. And uh, I asked her during the call, I said, you know, how much do you, did you discover, how much do you think uh, was was really taken in in this scenario, and and she kind of hesitated, and it, the answer was about twenty to thirty thousand dollars, and she was just devastated at that amount. And I think that's really the powerful part about this case because by the time I ended up finishing the case, we had over a quarter million dollars in theft, and and once I counted it all up and and had to make that phone call to the client to let her know, it was one of the most difficult phone calls I've ever had to make in my career because not only was the impact much, much greater than she thought, but the, the dollar amount that I came up with almost exactly matched the total that she still owed on her dental school debts. And you could hear this kind, sweet, compassionate person turn into a very angry, very vengeful person. She really, really wanted to go after this suspect with everything that we possibly could. Um, so we're prosecuting criminally, and she's also filed a, a civil complaint with her. Uh, this photograph was texted to me by the client. She was actually present at the arrest. Uh, she really wanted to get photographs and, and watch this embezzler go down. And so she texted me this moments after it was taken. Uh, she was very happy that there was an arrest. Um, the case right now is still pending. Uh, I think we have a court, case, a court date coming up uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, she's out on her own recognizance right now, but she is in big trouble with this jurisdiction. Um, another email that the client sent to me later uh, was of this. This is actual cash money that was given to her in uh, return for services rendered. And she was just so happy because she knew that she was going to be able to keep all of that. Um, if we hadn't have done what we did and caught Danielle in her actions, uh, there's a good chance that most, if not all of this money would not have found its way into uh, my client's bank account. Um, so she's moving forward now. She's got a great attitude about it. She knows what to look for. She knows what answers are viable answers when she asks questions of her new front office person. Uh, and she knows how to check things. It's a trust but verify. And you'll hear that phrase, phrase a lot uh, around Prosperin and it is trust but verify. Um, and so she's uh, she's moving forward and, and everything's good. And we'll hopefully let you know on our wall of shame how the court case turns out. Thanks, Scott. Uh, for for uh, recording that in advance. Um, the one other thing I'll mention here before we we go to um, all right. The oops, sorry. case that I, uh, I want to talk okay. to you guys. About. That was a that was a technical glitch. Um, sorry about that. Before we go to Sonia, the one other thing I'll mention is that that picture of the arrest. The sweetest thing about that was that it was arranged to happen right in front of Danielle's attorney's office. Um, it just it just doesn't get any better than uh, than, than arresting somebody at their lawyers. Um, over to you, Sonia. Okay, um, Scott, that very interesting case. It's very sad when we hear stories about that, and we all have our share of those sad stories. Uh, one of the questions I always have, and we don't always get um, to hear about it, is. Um, uh, is, is there a possibility for any restitution in this case of the doctor getting any of that money back? I, it always, it always pains me to, you know, whether, whether there's restitution, especially when the amounts are that high. Um, what, what did she, so two parts, what did, did you find out what she used the money for? Is the money gone or is there anything that can be recovered in any kind of way or? Um, the case is still pending, both both civil and criminal. And 
so we're not sure what we're going to be able to squeeze out of that turnip. Um, we do know that she did get um, some recovery from her uh, employee dishonesty insurance, um, which is good. But the fact that they're going after civilly uh, as well as criminally, I mean, a, a, a criminal restitution order is one thing, but um, civil, uh, you know, a lot of times you can you can eke a little bit more recovery out of that. Um, I'm not sure if the money is still available or if it's tied up in other assets. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Okay. Um, yeah, that's about it. That was a great case, Scott. I feel really sad when I hear stories like that, but most of our stories have, you know, when we find embezzlement, I mean, it's, it's always a sad time when we don't find embezzlement. I mean, we feel happy, but at least, you know, um, they, they have some kind of, uh, degree of comfort knowing it's not going on or it is going on. So thank you. Thanks, Sonia and Scott. Um, yeah, you know, there's a there's a tragedy behind every embezzlement. Um, I'll I'll just go back to something Scott said a second ago. Essentially when when embezzlement happens, every dentist gets something back. Um, whether they get everything back or not depends on the factors. <coughs> And one of the other things that comes across in, in these stories, and it, it came clearly with Scott's, when people confess, they confess to far less than they actually stole. And Amber and I were interviewing a suspect this morning. And um, she, Amber asked her, like, how much do you think you've stolen? And I think the number she gave Amber was around $25,000. And our investigation's not finished yet, but, you know, we're... We're cl closing in on a hundred thousand for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So some 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 great stories, and uh, I'll I'll add some great storytellers. That I, I've I've seen this presentation before, and it was still captivating for me. So um, let's just look at our kind of global takeaways from this, and then once that's done, we'll um, we'll kind of open it up to question and answer from from the audience. So the interesting thing that um, for each story with this is, this really reminded me of what Sonia said, if you have that spidey sense, go with your gut. You know, if something doesn't seem right, stop, follow your intuition and really stop and evaluate and, and ask a professional for help. I think that's a key thing when with go with your intuition. Uh, don't think you're gonna do the deep diving and discovery on your own. Absolutely. And I'll go back to something that Tony said. Um, you know, the way humans approach trust is kind of interesting. You meet somebody and you normally decide fairly early in the relationship whether that person is trustworthy or not. And then what we want to do is lock that up in a closet and never, ever open that closet door again. And, you know, we think, for example, that we should be able to trust our spouse. And in, in general, that's true. Um, However, there are events in divorce is, is pretty high on the list where the economic interest of you and the economic interest of your spouse suddenly diverge. Um, I, I got a call this morning from a, a dentist and uh, just, just in the process of going through a divorce and the spouse is still working there. And my question to the dentist was, well, how much sense does that make? Oops. Okay, now I really messed things up. Um, <laughs> okay, how, how do I get that back, Amber? <laughs> uh, okay, I'll just push random buttons and hope for the best. Well, that really wasn't yeah. it. Yeah. Okay, I think I should just stop now, Amber. Whoops. Okay. Uh, Let's go back to yours, and I'll just stop touching stuff. Okay. Um, so pressure and is either financial or emotional. So I always tell people that, you know, there's always outside influences that can cause people to go down and choose an unethical path. Um, but realistically, it's the road of opportunity and what that road looks like that controls how they do it, meaning how much they get away from it. Is it a, a bumpy road or smooth sailing, nice new, new paved road? So, you know, there's always gonna be the pressure there, but realistically, it's the opportunity that is open to these people who um, have 
that internal urge to complete this task uh, that's going to determine how much they're going to commit this crime. Yeah, and this came out from something that Kelly said. Um, one of the interesting things about embezzlement that differentiates it from a lot of other crime is that you have a, a series of crimes, a whole, a whole series of small crimes against the same victim. You know, car thieves don't keep stealing cars from the same person, they move on. But embezzlement happens in small amounts. Um, they grow over time, but you're, you know, you're still talking hundreds of dollars perhaps per theft or maybe even thousands, but not millions. And over yeah. time, those small thefts can add up to a lot of money. Well, and I'd like to add something about that too that, that Kelly said is, you know, she kept that road of opportunity open because she kept the dentist happy too. So they realized that opportunity and, and really try to keep that uh, well managed, like, so that's not as suspicious. Absolutely. Smuggle right up to the doctor's family. Mm -hmm. um, so stealing is often discovered um, by accident, meaning um, a, a lot of times dentists don't even have that intuition. Uh, it may be a team member that comes to you or years later, your uh, accountant or you hire a new person that sees something that doesn't seem right. So a lot of times, just because something doesn't feel like it's out of place, doesn't mean something isn't going on that you're not aware of. Absolutely, and um, you know there there um, there have been studies done that show that roughly eighty percent of embezzlement is found by what I'm going to call dumb ass luck, and the other twenty percent happens through the control systems that put people in place. I, I think a couple of things come out of that. One is that we probably need better control systems in a lot of practices that we than we have, but in the cold light of day, most embezzlement is uncovered by some kind of chance occurrence. And if you think about Pat's case, you know, Dennis number two uh, found out about the time bomb she had taken away at her front desk because I guessed her name. Um, and again, this is something that a lot of dentists will miss on. And I, I know this about you guys, you all hate the process of hiring people. You know, the thought of sitting there with 30 resumes and getting down to the three you want to interview and then pick the one you want to hire, you can't stand that. And like any job you hate, if somebody offers you a shortcut, you take it. And again, in Pat's case, dentist number two never called dentist number one. If that phone call had happened, Kim never would have gotten a job with Dennis number two. So no matter what happens, no matter what somebody says to you, don't skip that one. So the, the last key point, and I like to use this, this fun little story. Um, if you wake up and you see dust everywhere, what makes that dust settle? have to have some rain and the wind has to die down. So that's the importance of making sure that everything is calm and settled in your practice. Know the details, reconcile, don't wait for a st storm to come through to help you settle your dust and realize the damage that has occurred. So that's the importance of really reconcile, know what goes in, know what comes out, and, and know all the details. And like I said, if you need help setting up a system, don't be afraid you know, to ask others for help on how do I keep the dust settled in my practice. Absolutely. I just want to mention some resources for people. Um, first of all, there's us and our doors wide open to you. If you have concerns, if you want to talk about how you can protect yourself against embezzlement, we'd love to talk to you. Um, we're going to make it easy because uh, we, we're offering a little bit of a sale and this is not something we do often, but until October 31st, if you need investigative services, uh, we'll be happy to give you a break on the fee. Um, I'd also like to mention our Hall of Shame, and you can see a little bit of, in the, little bit of it in the background here. Uh, this is a place where we collect stories like the ones we've told you today. Um, and the web address is there. 
the follow-up email that's going out in a few minutes will have that web address as well. Uh, the Hall of Shame is searchable, so you can look by city or by state or by last name. Uh, we put as many pictures of these people as we can find because sometimes they apply using a different name or something. Um, so uh, if it's 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 kind of entertaining reading sometimes and and also some some good information and we've gotten more than a few calls over the years from a doctor who said yeah i was looking around in your hall of shame and i saw my office manager's picture there so that's a that that's a great resource and we don't ask for much here but um, one resource that we would like is if you if you enjoyed tonight um please leave us a five-star google review and you can you can do it by going to that website and it'll it'll take you right to the correct page on google um, here we are. I'm putting up Scott's picture again because I love that one so much. And uh, I, I understand that the, the, the victim in this case is in the audience tonight. So we'd like to send a shout out to that person. Um, and what we're going to do now is just uh, end the slideshow part of this. And we'll, we'll bring all of our, uh, our, our, our team back on. And I'll invite them to turn on their cameras and unmute themselves. And uh, if, if there are audience questions, we We'd love to tackle them right now. Um, let me see if I can find the right button. Yeah, there's uh, there's everybody. Um, and I, I did want to give a shout out to a friend of mine. Her name is Janice Hurley. Uh, Janice is a is a consultant, and uh, she's uh, she's got a lot of talents. But uh, one of the things that she's known for is being dentistry's image expert, and she's helped a lot of. Uh, a, a, a lot of people with uh, what, what I would call uh, major league makeovers. So uh, terrific to have Janice uh, with us. And I just uh, wanted to say hi to her. And she asked a question. Um, Amber, I don't know if you had a chance to answer it, but... Um, yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, good. Then, then, then we got that. So let's, uh, let's see if we've, if we've got anything else um, that, that, that we want to take. And... Uh, Amber, uh, any any questions we want to bring forward here? Um, we had a, a a person from our audience ask a question to Sonia. Uh, Sonia, you mentioned law that law enforcement had her conduct a forensic exam. Um, do they hire or pay the DA for the investigation since it wouldn't normally be for them, or did the doctor still hire for you? So there, she's wanting to know uh, what who paid our bill. Yeah. yeah. So, so basically we were engaged by the dentist. So um, I took most of my direction from the dentist. Um, he authorized me to deal directly with police, but anytime there was any um, extra services being provided that um, required additional, like over and above payment of our regular services, I would contact the dentist. Um, our report was provided to the dentist, but definitely to keep in mind that it was going to be used um, for police um, for the case. Uh, there was a preliminary um, uh, action that we took with police because we had to get a production order. Um, David, in the US, that's called a warrant? Subpoena. A subpoena, sorry. So we had to get a production um, order or a subpoena to obtain bank records for the um, suspect. So uh, we, we had to do a lot of work in order to get that approved by the judge. Um, so that was extra services that we did that we got approval from the dentist to do. And then um, after that, all the services that we rendered were just billed to the dentist and the report was provided to the dentist and the police used our report when they um, were pursuing the charges, yeah. All right, and uh, maybe Sonia, I'll ask you a follow-up question. Um, what was it like working with the police? I mean, what did you take away from that experience? Because I know you've done a lot of investigations, but that was really the the, the closest you, you know, the most uh, intimately you've worked with the police. Uh, yeah, they were, they were excellent to work with. Um, they really needed a lot of guidance. Yeah. Um, so they kind of just would tell me basically what they were looking to do. And then I had to formulate a plan um, in order to satisfy and present something to them that was going to be suitable. But there was a lot of back and forth. But, you know, the police don't always know 
all the insights and outs of an investigation and all the details that we have to um, put together and follow through. So, you know, it, it was it was a lot of work on our part, but, you know, definitely I, I kept in mind everything, the objectives that they were trying to achieve and made sure that we we matched what they were looking to be done. So basically, uh, yeah, that was the first case I had done so um, in, intensely with the police, but it was good experience. And I actually um, followed up with the detective uh, just this week before tonight's uh, webinar, just to touch base with them and, and see how things are going and uh, where they're at with the case. So they're very forthcoming with information and you know they're still happy to deal with Prosperident and he was looking forward to, well, maybe not looking forward to, but if he ever needed to work with um, our services again. <laughs> yeah, what, what people don't always appreciate is how technical a crime this is. And, you know, the people in police departments, especially small police departments, really can't specialize in, in commercial crime. And you know when when Kelly Paxton was a was an investigator for the sheriff's department, um, you know they were incredibly fortunate to have somebody of your knowledge level. And most most police departments, even fair size ones, just don't have that. Um, and then when you move from investigating kind of white collar crime in general to dental embezzlement specifically. Uh, you know, you, you, you escalate the problem a whole other level. I mean, think about the things and, and our audience members are familiar with, with all the stuff I'm talking about, you know, the interplay between dental insurance and what patients pay and the nuts and bolts of practice management software, all those things. I mean, a, an, an investigator who is good at other white, other types of white collar crime can be just lost in that. And Kelly, I don't know if you if you have anything to add in terms of, you know, how how challenging this kind of investigation really can be. Well, I always say uh, cops don't become cops to play with pivot tables or practice management software. <laughs> um, and if they do, they're probably an IRS agent. So th that that is challenging for them. Um, and the other thing, one of the things that I bring up when I have a victim is that there is no CSI embezzlement. And I, I just talked to a victim over the weekend, not of a dental embezzlement, but a million dollar, you know, parent getting ripped off. And they are so disappointed in the justice system because it took so incredibly long. So one of the things that I really like to say, I'm a fraud therapist, and I'm also sort of the liaison between law enforcement and the victim. Because a lot of victims really, they've never dealt with law enforcement before. So I kind of bridge the two. I know what what they need. The other thing that is sort of my latest one is if you walked into your home and you saw a dead body, would you touch it? And I think no one out there would probably touch it, but you walk into an embezzlement and oh dear, there's just, they're messing up with the evidence. It is a crime scene. And you need to remember it is a crime scene and you do need professionals. So even though we don't have a dead body, it still is a crime scene. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and one thing, Kelly, to build on that that surprises a lot of people is just how maddeningly slowly the justice system works. And Pat, I know you uh, encountered this in your story about Kim because um, I, I forget the exact chronology, but um, Kim was fired by dentist number one. I'm thinking three to four years ago from now. Uh, and she's still not in jail. Still hasn't even gone to trial. Yes, it's actually been a little over four years now. Yeah. And, you know, we all understand that COVID has kind of ground the court system down. And I was trying to explain to somebody this morning that the challenge of having a jury trial and finding a courtroom where you can keep 12 jurors six feet apart from each other and from everybody else. Um, you know, so, so COVID, COVID has uh, slowed down the court system, but let me tell you, it didn't move very quickly before. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sonia, just on on your pal Jennifer, um, I'm I'm trying to think of the chronology there, and it was, um, it was. Two One and of the faster ones I've ever seen. Yeah. Yeah, it was, and um, I, I'm I'm not sure how we got it done so quickly. Um, I think the police had a really good appetite for that one, based on the amount that was um, under consideration, as well as um, you know maybe the dentist was uh, you know on them a little bit more than typically to to get this result. Um, but yeah, once once they made the decision, she was picked up. I think at the border. Yeah. Um, she was crossing the border and they picked her up and she was charged and um, things happened relatively quickly like uh, the case yeah I'd say under a year yeah and I, I think in large part that was because you did such a thorough professional job with the homework and yeah. it was it was easy for the police to process when you had done your work yeah definitely because I mean I I didn't want to be the um the slow linkage in there. <laughs> I wanted to to get things done quickly and off my plate. And there was a lot of back and forth. But yeah, once it was done, it was um yeah, they acted on it relatively quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Here. Um how are you doing there, Scott Clifford? What's the what's the news in your part of the country tonight? You you have no power at home, I assume? No, it's good and bad. Um I actually got power about fifteen minutes ago. Um, which is really early, but they did it on the heels of an announcement that there's another uh, extreme wind event coming Sunday through Tuesday. So wow. it's good and bad. Um, Scott, um, Scott's, Scott's wife, whose name is Rose, also works with us. Uh, we're, we're privileged to have uh, the, the, the Cliffords as a husband and wife couple. And um, the big wild, there was uh, some, some big wildfires in California two years ago that came very close to their house. In fact, uh, Scott's father and mother's house, I think, burnt down. Um, did I get that right, Scott? Yeah, yeah. My, my parents' house burned down. The, the entire town of Paradise basically burned down. It got my aunt and uncle as well. It missed us by about five streets. Um, but that was the, the campfire. Yeah. from 2018 november so so that was two years ago and um scott's wife rose had a kind of harrowing escape actually and um you know then th they've you guys have been under notice or, or or watch for at least the last three or four weeks that i can remember yeah the the problem in norcal is is that you get the the winds um, that that accompany most people's fall, but we don't get rain with it. So it just continues to dry things out. And, you know, people think of, of our extreme fire season to be, you know, the, the July, August frame. And that's really not as bad as, as once it gets later into October and November, we're still in fire season and, until the rains come in earnest. Um, and it's worse because the, the, you know, winds, you don't get that much wind in July and August like we do in, in October, November. Yeah, we've, uh, you know, Scott, Scott and Rose and, and their daughter, Mickey, um, who, who has done some work for us as well and is, is currently studying forensic accounting. So she, um, she will likely be the third Clifford at Prosperit uh, in, in, a, in a big way at some point. Um, you know, they've, they've had a, a, just a, a horrible, stressful couple of years. Um, Under siege. Yeah, under siege, exactly. Um, Amber, any any last questions that we want to bring forward before we we all call it a night? Yeah, I have I have one. Um, a, a audience member asked this, and it relates to Scott's case. Uh, what best practices do you recommend to track cash that a front office receives from patients, and it happens frequently? Um, the one of the great tools that that you have is is actually your practice management software um it, you know when 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 you're sitting in your office or even when you're at the back you can always run a, a quickie day sheet throughout the day to see what cash is coming through um because oftentimes you know patients want receipts for cash payments and um so they need to get entered 
correctly originally the first time in in a lot of cases um and and then they get manipulated and 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 stolen from there and so you've got your audit trail in your software hopefully you have a, a good audit trail um and, and different practice management softwares present the the data differently um but uh you know and then there's just you know visuals you know when you look around your office if you see a paper receipt book you know what is that there for um if you see somebody working with uh excel or word uh that doesn't really have a reason to they could be you know creating uh copies of receipts things like that that they can give to patients you you really want that original entry to go in the software correctly the first time um and then the receipt be generated for the for the patient out of the software not out of any external program or an external book anywhere um but you know keep track of it keep track of it throughout the day um uh, and and there's even some you know uh external services uh you know practice uh, uh metric services that will, will actually text you whenever a cash payment's entered into your software um you know th things like that can always help but you know just be on alert because cash is is very tempting for even the honest person um to to abscond if 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 nobody knows they're doing it and and that turns them automatically into a dishonest person by nature but um you know and there's a lot of a lot of different demographics that are very cash heavy um some offices might see only you know half a percent or one percent of their total payments coming in cash where other offices depending on the location the demographics and the type of work that's around um you know might see six to seven percent of their total payments being cash payments um you know so just yeah. just watch it and and also understand cash isn't the only thing that gets stolen you know uh, we've had some cases where all the cash went into the bank correctly and it was something else that got stolen right right um, right i'll add something to that um covid has given every practice the perfect excuse to not take cash anymore you know uh, mm -hmm. as as dentists move to a more contactless uh, office setup that's the chance to say look we just you know because of covid we just can't accept cash anymore um you know cash is and, and scott's right i mean other th thieves will certainly take other things um, but cash is the first choice of every thief. You know, it's the it's the most mobile, most volatile thing that you have. So in my mind, as long as this is presented properly and of course communicated in advance, so you can't have people showing up at appointments um, with cash ready to pay only to find out that, you know, cash is no good here anymore. Uh, but to me, COVID's the, the perfect excuse not to take cash. Now, if if your practice, as Scott says, you know, is is in farm country, that may be a huge challenge. If you have an urban practice, it shouldn't be a problem. Yeah, right. Uh, one more question from our audience: Are payment deletions common? Why don't we uh, ask Tony to comment on that, Amber? Because he's, he's he's somehow managed to stay stay silent through this. Uh, <laughs> This discussion. Uh, well, I think uh, they shouldn't be, but it depends in part on the practice management software because people do make mistakes. You're, you're keying stuff in and you're going fast and you put the check number in the check amount um, field when you're keying it in. And some practice management softwares make it easy to go in there and kind of modify a, a payment once it was entered. Some uh, either if they don't, or maybe even by personal preference, um, kind of provide for that payment to be deleted and then re-entered. So ultimately, it shouldn't be common as we understand that word typically. Um, if it is, that means you have either someone with a poor work product, they're making a lot of mistakes and they're having to fix them, or there is something that needs to be looked into, but they will happen on occasion. And uh, that's why it's good at the end of a day, end of a week, if you could pop open an audit trail, again, depending on the practice management software, and just kind of keep an eye and establish what is a baseline level for your staff. And then you can kind of peg that against any fluctuations, determine if it's something that you should look into. Perfect. Thank can you. I add something to that? Yes, yeah, Scott. 
Um, the only thing that I would add to that is the the deletion should always be looked at to see what was re-entered. You you want to you know the deletion doesn't necessarily mean anything by itself. It's what got re-entered that is the important part. Yeah, um, I can't get into too much detail in this particular forum, but but you really want to look at, at at what was put back in after the deletion. Yeah, great answer um, from both of you. And um, we do have an update on uh, Scott's case. And here it is. Uh, the doctor has won a civil suit against uh, Ms. Powers and was awarded a judgment for over $1 million. Wow. And the doctor will pursue a wage garnishment when it's allowed to happen. And the criminal case goes in front of a grand jury last week or next week, sorry. So Scott mentioned both a, a civil and a criminal action there, and you, you just got an update on both of them. So um, that one was a, was a tremendous case and a, and a real feather in, uh, in, in Scott's cap. And, uh, you know, when we're, when we're quite, we, we take some pride in. So um, I'd like to thank our guest panelists and of course my, my uh, uh, terrific co-host uh, Amber. Uh, thank you all for being with us and, and telling some great stories. And uh, I, I, I really didn't know um, how good how good storytellers some of us were. So uh, we, we may call on you guys again in the future. Um, I'd also like to thank our audience tonight because uh, all of you who are with us live uh, made a choice between uh, this and the presidential debate. So uh, thank you for joining us live. And uh, if, if you're listening to the recorded version, uh, we, we understand. I mean, it's, it's really hard to compete with uh, certain world events and we get it. Um, but thank you for being a part of our audience and we look forward to seeing you next month. Just a reminder that uh, there's an email that went out about uh, seven minutes ago with a link. You can, you can sign up for next month and get continuing ed and all those things. So thank you, everybody. Have a great night and be safe and we'll see you on... November 19th. Hi. Thank you. Thanks Bye. a lot, everybody. Thanks. This concludes this episode of the Prosperident webinar series. The team will be back soon with more tools and ideas. If you have questions about this webinar, if you would like to discuss your practice with one of us, or if there is a topic you would like to see in a future webinar, we would love to hear from you. You can contact Prosperident through its website, www.prosperident.com, or by calling 888-398-2327.